Thanks, Jake. That, and that really does uh, segue well into what we're going to be talking about today and that idea of deeper relationships. What happened? Oh, sorry. She's, she's, she's the in-house tech guru. Uh, buffer slides, that's a thing. All right. So uh, anyways, yeah, so that, that's really the heart of it. And that's really where I want us, I just talked about land for the next two to three months, really get to know each other well, really be that community for each other. We, a lot of you were able to watch that video from last week. We can't possibly live out that kind of loving display of community for other people if we can't figure out how to do it for each other. And so we want to make sure we hit that hard here in the beginning, and we're going to look at how to do these deeper relationships in the different realms over the next uh, several months and hopefully, hopefully forever. I did want to give you an update. So I looked at a couple buildings this past week. Um, we looked at the Old Schoolcraft Elementary, and then they also own the Wind and James building down there. Uh, I don't know if you guys have ever been to an event center. So I'm talking to the owner of that, Jamie Clark, and he seems eager to try to see if we can make something work. We're still in conversation with that, but I wanted to give you the heads up on that. I want to kind of keep you guys in the loop as best I can about all this background workings. Again, if you guys know somebody, talk to somebody, especially if somebody wants to just give us something, that would be cool too. Uh, but I uh, wanted to update on that and uh, let you know that I'm kind of talking to him some more as well. Um, trying to think if there's any other things that we wanted to update before we jump into this. All right, so we're going to go into this. This is our shape for the week. Uh, we're going to, it's called the triangle. This is actually, actually chapter seven of your book. You don't need to, there's no rush, but I would encourage you guys to read through chapter five up to this point. We're jumping to chapter seven. We'll go back to six after next week. Uh, next week's the worship night. We don't meet here in the morning. And uh, the week after is when we'll jump into that the net chapter six shape, the learning circle. So this is the triangle. This is where this, this uh, organization, 3DM, gets their name, three-dimensional ministry. It comes from this. And so basically, if you look at Jesus's life, and this is where a lot of what they build their, their, their philosophy out of is saying, if Jesus is, the, is God incarnate, is, is quite literally God uh, created in human form because for many, many years, God's followers couldn't figure out how to do this whole following God thing very well. They kept, you know, it's, if you think about it from the beginning in the garden, he had God with, Adam and Eve had God with them and they still screwed that up. And so we go and, and they were separated from God and there was this weird ambiguous time where God would just kind of interject occasionally with messengers and angels and that sort of thing. And then you see in the time of Moses, they're still not getting it right. And so God introduces the law, the Ten Commandments to help guide them to faithful living, still not working. They introduce, gives them prophets to try to correct his people. And then we have Jesus, the incarnate God, come down and say, all right, you guys are worthless. Uh, he didn't say that. I say that. You guys are worthless. Let me show you how it's done. And so a lot of how we build our ministry, we should actually try to mimic what Jesus does. And it's, it doesn't uh, dis, discount other scripture or anything. I'm not, I'm not saying that, but we should look at how Jesus lives his life and mimic that to the best of our abilities. And so where they get this is they say, let's look at Jesus's life and let's look at Luke 6 um, and, and see this pattern really quickly. And so what happens is uh, Jesus, let's find here. Uh, what's that? No, I'm good. So at the end of, or at the beginning of Luke 6, Jesus is doing, they're talking about Sabbath with the Pharisees, and Jesus is having this teaching about Sabbath, and it's because uh, Jesus is constantly going out. You see this pattern where he'll go out and pray on his own. He'll go into these caves and pray on his own. He'll find that time with God, the Father, all the time. And you see everything about Jesus is rooted in this relationship. Sorry. Rooted in this relationship with the Father. And that becomes the very source. So this is the heart. That doesn't work. 
This is the heart of how we should shape our lives, our relationships, our balance, our spiritual life too. Is Jesus always started with the up relationship with the Father. Everything was rooted in that relationship with the Father. He would go pray. We see the night before he was afraid, he's, before he was betrayed, he was in the Garden of Gethsemane praying to the Father. But this becomes the ultimate source of how Jesus lives his life well as man. And out of that, go on to Luke 6, you see uh, after this is when Jesus, uh, so right there, verse 12, on, the, on those days Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. So he spent his night praying to God. And then it says, when morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them who he also designated apostles. And it goes off to list the names of the apostles. So he starts in this upward relationship with the Father. He moves in to this inward relationship with the community of uh, what will eventually be his closest friends, believers, uh, Jesus followers. And then uh, it goes on later, and he says he went down with them and stood in a level place. A large crowd of his disciples was there, and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem, and from the coastal region around Tyre and Sidon who had come to hear him to be healed of their diseases. And it shifts to this outward relationship with people outside of the community of, of followers, of the community of believers that need help, that need healing. And this is this three-dimensional ministry that we're saying if, if the life of Jesus is living out how Jesus did it, this is how Jesus did it. It was always based in his relationship with the Father. That was the source of everything that he gained spiritually. And it turned in to that community of believers, like Jake was talking about, that supported, strengthened, and encouraged them, all so that we could go out and minister to those who need healing, need freedom, need restoration, who need Jesus. And this is something I, I thought was really profound the first time I heard this because I realized most churches, most Christians have a hard time balancing these relations out, relationships out evenly. We're usually pretty good at one or two even, and we're terrible at another one. And if we say the goal is ultimately to balance these out, to live uh, these deeper relationships in every one of the realms, then how do we actually start living our lives to reflect that? And so even as you think about it now, I want you to just introspectively think, all right, what is the easiest for me to do? What do, what do I just kind of default piece of cake? And then what's the one that it just, for whatever reason, I have the hardest time really engaging that part of my spirituality, that part of uh, relationships in my life? I think for many, it's probably the out. Uh, which I was super encouraged. A lot of you have already turned back those five-fold results. I saw a high level of evangelism for a lot of the people in this group, which is pretty cool. That's important with a church plant, I would say. Uh, so that's exciting. So maybe that isn't yours. Maybe, maybe yours is actually the in or the up, and that's why, you know, the up we talked about from day one, establishing that rhythm. Uh, the old monks used to call it the rule of life, right? How do you live out your life daily to worship the Father? And so I want to kind of address these a little bit. And I think uh, we need to ask, where are we weak? Where are we strong? And the churches we've been a part of reflect a little bit. Not, not, not mean and judgmentally, just to be honest assessment and say, where did they land and what was my experience? But I want to kind of call out maybe our own heart in this. And I want to start with that up piece. And one of the things that I realized, and this is why we're doing the worship night next week, is that I really want to hold back and, and starve you a little bit from the worship. And I still want to do that. Uh, but realizing if, if I'm going to be a leader with, an inte with integrity, I need to make sure this group has that balance too. So it probably is fitting that we do that corporate worship at least once a month. Uh, but what I don't want it to be is that you become wholly dependent on the church providing that worship. And I think that's the place we get into often as we get into church routines is our, our upward relationship with the Father becomes really scarce or really sparse because we just plan to show up at church on Sunday 
and let the pastor and the worship band do it all for you. And that's also the reason I'm kind of starving you because I want to push myself and push each one of you to say, what would it look like to build really strong upward worship patterns for this next season? Because it's out of that pattern that we're going to have the ability to do those other relationships really well. The other one is this in. It's really exciting for me to want to push you guys out right now, kind of go out, go, go build it, go you know, connect with people from work, from your neighborhoods, and I'm going to keep doing that. But I have to make sure we stay balanced too, and it would be really detrimental for each of you if I do that too hard and you guys are starting to neglect the relationships in here. I've talked to a few people in the last couple weeks that are really struggling. And I worry, I'm like, man, if we don't know each other well, who are they going to turn to when they're really struggling, we got to make sure we build this core together. We have to make sure that we know who's struggling so we can help them, encourage them, strengthen them. And we're actually going to talk about that next week at the worship night, uh, the, the kind of the Christian activity in Antioch, uh, the early Christians, and how they did that well. But I want to encourage you guys, and, and, and I'm going to put you on the spot here. I asked you two weeks ago, to meet up with somebody on this team that you don't know very well, that you, that you don't live with, right? I want to ask how many people did that over the last two weeks? All right, some of you did, that's pretty good. A lot of you didn't, not so good, but I know you're busy. All right, that's the other thing is I, I, I don't want to put these weird challenges and expectations on you and feel like you're a failure. I, have, I ride this weird tension all the time, and I think probably a lot of pastors do, is that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you in on a little secret. Pastors are just as insecure as everybody else, maybe more. And so often pastors will look to like a Sunday morning attendance or something that, like that to be able to decide, am I being successful? Am I, am I accomplishing what I set out to? And if they don't see that, then they get really insecure, and then you get really hardcore challenged, and then you, you might be pushed in that checkbox mentality. I don't want the checkbox mentality here. I'm trusting you guys. So even those who didn't raise your hand, I don't want to judge you. I just want you to see that other people are doing it and be encouraged by that, and maybe that extra added challenge, because I think the heart of where real ministry is going to be done here is not here, and it's not even in the church building. If you're not here on Sundays now or in the future, my hope and my belief is that you're out doing ministry where it matters. And, and I'm not going to pressure you, but I'm, I'm letting you know right now, it'll probably drive my insecurities wild a little bit. Uh, so you just have to give me a little bit of grace there. Uh, but I say all this, I kind of sidestep in here to emphasize we really need to know each other. We need to take care of each other. We need to, to develop that inward relationship right here, grow close and tight together. And then hopefully out of that, we're able to go out. And that's why we're spending these first couple months really doing this well. Now, I hope that you're regularly engaging people out and around you already. Um, and, and, and the reality is Jesus was before he gathered his disciples too. So it's not like we have to wait to go out until we know each other really well. But I will say we need to build this core. And then out of that, we go and minister to the people around us. Out of that strength that we do that well. And this... What this is going to be, this is going to be us just going out to the people we're already in relationship. Remember, many of you guys, uh, I think most of you guys were at that vision meeting, right? These, these circles here, remember these circles? These were the big crowds. This was the church in between. I want you guys living in these crowds, this space out here. This is where all that ministry is going to happen. This is where people are actually going to experience the gospel. That video last week. He talked about we have to display the gospel before there's ever a need for us to proclaim the gospel. And out here is where we're going to display it. This is where the out exists. I mentioned an update on the church building, and I really would like to have a place where we know, just honestly for anxiety and all of that, but I'm, I'm going to call another thing to the table, and that all of us really want that. We all want to know where we're going to land. It's, it's maddening at times, but I think it's the best thing God could have done is not giving us a building because it forces us to figure out our mission and our philosophy and our community before our building. Because like it or not, as soon as we have a building, 
all of our attention is going to want to turn inward towards that building. It's not the worst thing in the world, but that's going to be natural. As soon as our attention turns inward into the building, we're no longer out here doing outward things. And so I really want us to, to be diligent and be looking for buildings, that sort of thing. But I don't want us to be so focused on it that we're waiting for that as the answer for how we do out ministry. We're waiting for that so we can invite somebody into it. So my challenge would be is actually how can we go out and find our church building uh, somewhere where you'd least expect it. I was talking to a church planner out of Holland this past week. And he started his first church this way. He, he said he was part of a mother church deal like this. He started bringing people uh, into their church community that, um, unfortunately, the, the parent church didn't react too kindly, you know, the, the marginalized people. And so they knew they had to just get away from that mother church building so that they could love on the people coming in. They didn't have a place. They, quite frankly, didn't even have much money. And so they started to get uh, creative. And this guy, uh, who was a part of the church, was a Christian businessman, owned a warehouse and said, what if you just use my warehouse on Sunday? It's empty. You just make it work. We won't charge you. But my only deal is, I, I, a lot of my workers come from like Southeast Asia and India. You need to provide services for them. And that's my trade-off. And he did that, and over several years built this church from basically this immigrant um, employee population, and they never paid a dime for a building, not even utilities or anything. And so it could be, this could be how it looks for us as a church, maybe, we don't know. But at the very minimum, I share that story because I want you to know that the church isn't a building, and you guys, a lot of you know that, but I want you to say to yourself, if we don't have a building right now, where is my church for the next month where am I going to go land and say this is my people and I'm going to take church to you and just camp out there maybe that's in your neighborhood maybe that's in your workplace maybe that's in a local kind of community center like uh, the Y where you work out or maybe it's uh, you know the local tavern where you like to catch up whatever it is where is that place where you want to go out and set up church and so those are those are kind of uh to address where we're at, but also this balance that we want to attain. So I'm going to kind of let you guys go. I think we have some discussion questions here. No transition, right? <laughs> All right. So I want you, actually, before you do this, you're going to take numbers out of there. You're going to go to a table, put the numbers back in before you leave the table so I don't have to cut them up and fold them again. Um, I want you to spend, what time is it here? It's 11.07. I want you to go to 11.15 and answer some of these questions on your own. Then go to the table that you draw and work through some of these questions with your people. Now here's, here's my disclaimer on this. Is this might feel really uncomfortable to go through these personal questions with people you don't know very well. Well, that's my point. I, if we're going to grow in the end, we have to get a little bit uncomfortable, a little honest with each other. Here's the other thing is what I hope our, these groups will be and long term our huddles will be is I want them to be a place where an individual can explore what is God saying to them, not what is Rick saying to them. Sorry, Rick. Right? <laughs> I, want, I want you guys to learn how to ask questions and draw people out, not tell them what you think they should do. Yeah, so the model for this is, now don't get me wrong, there are great opportunities for people to speak life into other people based on their experiences or the wisdom God's given them. But often we can impose ideas that aren't even from God. They're just our own experiences. And so where a lot of times the group dynamic will kind of go in a circle, if you picture a wheel, it'll go from this person to this person to this person to this person. When we get into this huddle structure, there will be a a leader of that huddle, and it'll look more like a wheel spoke where that person's going out to those different people. Okay, that person is going to ask more questions than give more answers. We don't have a designated leader at these tables, so you can't experience that fully, but what I want to get you in the practice of is asking questions to each other to draw them out, to get them to a place of discovery 
so that they can uh, hear what God's saying and move into some attainable action step. An attainable action step, not because we're moralists and checklist Christians, but because at the end of the day, we've talked about this, learning isn't just attaining head knowledge, it's actually doing it and changing your behavior. And so that's why we do those things. So take the next, I just took up three minutes of your time. Go to, <laughs> go to, go to like 1120, that's 10 minutes. Answer these questions. Be thoughtful. We'll, we'll, we'll put on some music and then shift in your tables at 1120 and just start going through those questions and making sure everybody has time to kind of walk through them.